forward to writing music that everyone remembers, like the movie themes of John Williams. Well, I spent a lot of time looking into this and I realized that while it can be broken down to a science, there's some extra special things that John Williams does that makes his music so successful and unforgettable. We're gonna break all of this down and more in this video. In order to really dig into this matter, I looked carefully at a lot of his scores, investigated his process, and even got to interview one of the greatest violinists of our time, Anna Sophie Mutter, who collaborates with John Williams in a fascinating way. For this video, I've organized what I learned into four parts. The first two focus on specific details in his music. The third subject is about something I noticed in his approach to music as a whole that no one ever mentions. And the fourth one is a great lesson on musicianship that I know I will carry with me for the rest of my life. As a special bonus, I also decided to challenge myself to create a track in the style of John Williams using everything that I learned. So make sure you stay until the very end to see the final results. This video is made as part of my creative residency at the Elbphilharmonie Concert Hall in Hamburg, Germany. Before we move on, I'd like to kindly ask you to subscribe if you haven't already, if you enjoy this type of content. It's my goal to share every significant discovery I make along my journey as a pianist composer, and every subscription helps to support and grow the channel. Part one, how to write a catchy theme. John Williams is so good at creating melodies that just stick. Can you hum me a theme from Indiana Jones? Da 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 da, da da da, da 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 da. Da, 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 da. Something like that. <laughs> you can hum them out of tune and you can still recognize them. They're simple and concise enough so that they're easy to remember, kind of like a national anthem or a hymn. Power of simplicity, of directness. I suppose it's like language in a way. If you can control language and shape a three or four sentence line, it will, it's more effective to people in 20 minutes of oration. Let's take a look at the very famous Jaws theme. We're dealing with just two different pitches in the beginning, which makes it extremely effective because the identity of what it is is so clear. It worked particularly well because it could be very soft, which is, is, you know, the softer we played it, the scarier it seemed to be. And the speed could be changed. It could be very slow. Like this, and go up to a very quick tempo. Along the lines of that, rhythm is such a crucial part of creating the character of a melody. And what John Williams is incredible at doing is to keep a consistent rhythmic theme for each melody. For example, in his Star Wars theme, the rhythm contains the conquest like heroic character. It's very distinct and recognizable on its own. Notice how the rhythmic theme also complements the pitches. The health note is placed after a leap. Now, if we had the same pitches and the rhythm except without the leap, it really is no longer Star Wars. Now for my track, I have an initial idea in B flat. And this is definitely out of my comfort zone because left to my own device, I would write something like what really helped me in this process was to approach writing a melody as if I was drawing using a thick and bold marker, as opposed to a very fine pencil. This is how I think of many of John Williams' themes. His melodic figures are like bold designs rather than delicate etchings. Now, something we absolutely need to talk about is John Williams' use of harmony. Here's Hedwig's theme from Harry Potter, which could be a very normal sounding waltzy theme if it weren't for a special twist in the chords. This is what it would sound like just by swapping out one chord with something more generic, like a five chord. Just by changing that small little detail, the character of the music all of a sudden changes. Now we have way less mystery. So here what John Williams is doing is instead of going from one, five, and back to one, he's substituting that five chord with this at first, which is kind of a B major seven plus sharp 11. And then later on he goes D minor over F sharp 
which is quite dissonant, and there's also no convenient way to analyze both of these chords. Another classic move of Williams is the chromatic median. You hear this when E minor goes to G minor. To simplify what a chromatic median is, you just take two chords that have the same quality, major, major, and place them a third apart. So a major third apart, or a minor third apart. You can use a chromatic median in so many different contexts. And you can do this with minor chords as well, the way John Williams does it. Immediately, this sounds like it would be in a movie. We also find chromatic medians in the Imperial March from Star Wars. Here, the character is much more imposing and stately than in Harry Potter for a few reasons, such as the held back tempo and the snare drum. This brings us to the next point. Part 2, Setting the Tone Something I find incredibly impressive about John Williams' music is his ability to immediately set the tone by grasping the character, the atmosphere of the scene, and translating it to a specific color in music. He primarily does this with orchestration. Subtlety is not the name of the game here. Notice the quick shifts in mood in the following scene from Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Writing to you. We have low strings to match the indecent nature of Harry's relatives, and a quick transition to Harry hinting at something mystical in the air. Now we switch to a flurry of scales and chimes to match the flight of the owl, and notice that the theme is played by the horns, which provides a more majestic character to signal the grand and magical world of Hogwarts. And then a very quick switch to low and ominous sounding woodwinds. Now here's something that gave me extra insight. What you're hearing is also a piece by John Williams performed by Anna Sophie Mutter at the Elb Philharmonie. This is his violin concerto number no. two, written for Mutter just a few years ago. And what stood out to me is just how different the pacing is compared to Williams' movie scores. Here, the main character is the violin and the music itself. We still hear signature bits of orchestration and soaring melodies. But the colors are less exaggerated his transitions are more subtle, and the piece takes you on a beautiful, longer journey while including a lot of space to wander. One of the primary differences between classical music for the concert versus classical music for film is the pacing. Think of an hour-long symphony. You have all of this time to build up. It's really about the development throughout this whole period of time. For film music, on the other hand, it's really about supporting the story. These so-called miniatures, if you want, they are no means miniature in, in demand because you need to be Leia or you need to be Rey or you need to be Geisha or you need to be Dracula right away. So your way of adapting the sound, the, the phrasing, has to be dead on. When you think of the sound of John Williams, there are so many classical composers that you can compare it to. And that's because of the tradition that he is following, but also the genre. I think his music has a lot of parallels to opera and ballet, because similar to film, you're dealing with a storyline and constant changes in scenes. Now for my track, I think I need a scene, and what might be perfect is this epic looking drone footage of the Elf Philharmony, especially because there's flying involved, which is a big theme in a lot of the movies John Williams has scored. Easy miss, I've got you. So instead of a slower pace, So I definitely need to up the energy, but I'm not so sure if the piano is the right choice of color. Maybe something with strings, orchestra, I'll check back in later. This brings us to the next point, which is a key to John Williams' success as a composer, mastering the context. 
different emotions that you're trying to express in music or with any art call for different amounts of projection, different amounts of extroversion or introversion. My favorite piece by Williams is this theme from Schindler's List. The emotions of heartbreak and heaviness carry very far outwards, kind of like the way a soprano would sing a very emotive aria. What John Williams is brilliant at doing is finding that appropriate level of projection to really make that emotion stand out. There's nothing excessive here, and I love that you can hear different solo instruments being highlighted in addition to the violin. The extra space in the music also helps the sound of the violin really project without being overpowered, and I think this adds to the tragedy of the sound. In order to apply what I learned about projection to the track I'm writing, I think I need a storyline, not just footage. This will help me define the emotion and atmosphere of the music. I think I'm going to make the drone a character. So we're going to pretend that this drone just overcame a near-death experience and is now discovering new lands and is excited about starting a new chapter. Now in terms of projection, I have to be really careful with the tempo here and also being specific about the instrumentation because if it's too thick, I feel like it's too epic. Something like that is probably a little too chirpy. I also want some pizzicato because it gives this lightness to the music and definitely a lot of runs that add sparkle. These are all details I notice in his music and also John Williams doesn't shy away from adding the most virtuosic lines, which makes his music fun and challenging to play. Now let's move on to a broader aspect of his music that I think carries the most impact. Part four, the power of being genreless. Now the greatest lesson I've learned while paying attention to John Williams' music and his career is that by embracing tradition, by drawing inspiration from multiple sources and embracing all genres, you can be a great ambassador. Because of his soundtracks, many movie fans have also become classical music lovers and vice versa. His music also carries strong elements of jazz. Here's a rare clip of Williams improvising on the piano. You can hear his jazz-influenced voicings in Schindler's List, for example, which can almost work as a jazz ballad without too much change. There are also elements of jazz in his concert music, like in his violin concerto number no. 2. After the introduction with the harp, the violin starts. It obviously is written out, but it is a kind of searching improvisation until we delve into the first genuinely big idea. What's also so special about Mutter and Williams' collaboration is that through her, the classical music world also gets to experience more concertized versions of his movie scores. Uh, what John did, for example, for Hedwig, which you heard yesterday evening, the cadenza, I mean, it is incredible. First of all, 12 tonal from A to Z. Layered. So layered and complex, and it is, I mean, some of the passage work at the end of Hedwig is some of the most difficult. Passage track, there is, period. And I am so happy it is that way. First of all, I am exclusively permitted to play it, yes. And secondly, um, it is so challenging and I have learned so much from it. The way that John Williams blends all of these genres makes him remain out of the box in a category of his own. You know, we, we in German have this Ernstmusik und Unterhaltungsmusik, which is totally crazy. It's like serious music and entertaining music. I mean, serious music is entertaining and entertaining music can be very serious. But we have decided to make this division at a certain point. It will be John Williams who will be finally the man to close that gap. He is really speaking to all of us. 
I'm gonna now leave you with the final version of my track. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you to the Elf Philomony and to my patrons on Patreon. And I'll see you very soon in the next video.